season one, episode 18. This week on Rebel Rebel, Dr. Willem Klumpenhauer joins me in studio to talk about the madcap world of transportation in cities. He drops some deep knowledge on using the principles of Brownian motion, geometric arguments, and calculus in a way that even I could understand how I could optimize any major transit system. Right. <laughs> and then, of course, there's some clarity on the age-old question. Are cyclists pedestrians, vehicles, or what? I'm your host, Michael Dean Dargy, Season 1, Episode 18, Doctor of Transportation on Rebel Rebel. Welcome to the Rebel Rebel Podcast. I am sitting here with Willem Klumpenhauer. Hey. Hi, Dargy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks so much for coming down. And uh, just so people know sort of who you are and what you do, I can now call you Doctor. You can, yeah, as of uh, a little over a month ago. Nice. Yeah, I just finished my PhD in transportation uh, yeah. in the engineering department at the University of Calgary. Wow. That is amazing. <laughs> so, Thanks. <laughs> it's still not entirely real yet, but... Right. Yeah. Uh, are you going to get cards made? Like, Probably at some point I should do that. Like yeah, that doctor good. With, with the FID on the yeah. end? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So, I, I, I mean, the reason why you're on the show is you are, without question, a creative rebel. Um, the, the stuff that you've done to understand the transportation system is incredible. Uh, you've been on a lot of different shows. Uh, here you're on the radio. You've got a, a website that you maintain. Uh, you're a man about town and people, you know, know your passion for transportation in the city of Calgary. Yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been an interesting sort of journey when I first decided to start, you know, talking a little bit more about transportation and it was part of sort of going through my degree. I decided to to see what what it looked like in the field rather than just in in academia. Yeah. And uh, it's been a really fun and interesting journey. Um there's from people from from Loose Moose sort of first directed me into to sort of speaking out and, yeah. and doing stuff like that and it kind of picked up from there and yeah. Um, so it's been a lot of fun writing, writing posts and talking to people and, and, uh, you know, being a bit of a shit disturber when, <laughs> when that's necessary. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you have disturbed some shits. Uh. <laughs> occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not afraid to, to pick a fight occasionally and, and yeah. point out where things are, are a little bit off or, or don't make a lot of sense. So. Can you, can you give me an example of maybe your top shit that you disturbed? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, there's been, uh, there's been a few projects that have sort of garnered some some interest and attention from various people yeah. uh, throughout uh, the past few years. Uh, obviously, the Southwest BRT project is in sort of a thing that never seems to, yeah. uh, you know, never seems to go away. It's it's a it's finally it's under construction. I just drove past the slip lane they're building in Lakeview this morning. Oh, so, cool! Uh, and that's so going to go right past the Moose, right? Uh, no, that's the Green Line. So that oh, would the be the line. the LRT. Yeah. No, this is the one that's going to go down 14th Street. Oh. Uh, past Heritage Park, and it's going to have for that section of it, it's going to have sort of a dedicated busway. But it's part of this larger push that Calgary's doing to have a bit more of a grid with their transit system and yeah. sort of have these these high priority routes that um, that kind of get you around the city rather than just in and out of gotcha. downtown. Right? Oh, yeah. so that sounds like a good thing. Yeah, it is. It's a, yeah. it's an awesome thing. Um, there's there's been some pushback from a small group of people who. Um, who I think don't want it to go near their house or I'm not sure uh, what the, what the impetus is, but it's been, it's been a lot of fun sort of standing up for the, for the sound principles of transit and, and yeah. sort of having a voice and it's been appreciated oh, good. a lot. So what is, so talk to me about the principles of transit. <laughs> <laughs> like what, what is that? that? That's a lot to get into. Uh, <laughs> I um, asked the tough questions. Yeah. Okay. So I, my basic, the way I, the way I like to think about it is that, um, in cities, people, the whole point of cities is that people want to live closer together for right. some reason or another, yeah. um, or they have to live closer together. The more people you put in a group, the more, you know, different varied things you can have. This is what makes cities wonderful is there's all these unique things that show up in cities that right. don't show up in other places. And, um, you know, there's opportunities, whether they're economic or social opportunities, you get to interact with people um, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you get all that collision that people yeah. like to talk about happening. So there's a positivity to cities and there's lots of studies and, and, and books and, and philosophies on why people want to live together. But the point being, it's when people want to live closer together, space becomes scarce. Right. And you want to try and make the best use of the space you have, the little space you have yeah. um, that you can. And uh, transit, the reason transit works so well in cities and is so crucial to, to letting cities grow and, and become 
um, become better is that you know if you if you think about yourself in a car and you draw a box around yourself driving in a car and and you've got a pretty big box plus the buffer between you and the other cars right. and then you think about yourself standing on a bus and you draw a box around yourself in a bus you can see the space difference and right. and from an individual level it doesn't seem like too much of a difference but that can mean you know that it's a huge a huge difference in terms of moving people around yeah when you when you bring people together yeah and the the whole sort of principle of transit is that um everybody sort of agrees to sort of give up a little bit of the convenience to to go in and visit a stop or walk to a stop and then through that you can actually get a whole lot more right. mobility done you can yeah. move more people um and so that sort of that sort of tension, that scarcity of space is what makes transit work really well. It's kind of a geometrical yeah. argument. Cool. So I, I saw an, a graphic, and I don't know whether it's something you posted maybe, but it showed a downtown street with cars in it um, with uh, actually people just sitting there like they're in a car and the amount of space that they take up. Then the next one was uh, bicycles and the amount of space they take up. And then it was a bus and then it was a train. So it gave you a really cool um, visual example of how much space car drivers take up yeah. in the world. Yeah, that's a very famous image. There's variants of all kinds, a very famous image, that wonderful geometric argument. I mean, the original one had people in cars, yeah. bikes, and a bus standing where they would be on a bus right. um, just to show the space difference. And one of the one of the more recent ones, which I which I really appreciate, is, uh, is one with the same thing. So you have a bus, you have bikes, you have cars, and then you have autonomous cars. And of course, it's the same image uh, as the cars, right? It doesn't... Yeah doesn't change the geometry part of it <laughs> just because they're driverless they still take up space so right um yeah so and that's sort of the principle on which you know you have to think about transit and that transit um, right. works and you did you did some of your work was around uh scheduling of bus times and uh stuff like that which i found fascinating could you sort of dumb it yeah, down give, for, dumb give, it down for me again can give you a cole's notes yeah i can do that so my thesis was um was focusing on uh, the reliability of bus routes uh, of buses and uh, common practice. If you've ever taken the bus, um, it's a, it's a common strategy that, you know, you ride along on a bus and it gets to a certain stop. Often it's a major transfer point, but there's some sort of stop where the bus will sit and it'll wait. Right. Um, and there's a number of different logistical reasons for that, but sort of from a reliability point of view, the advantage of, of waiting and you build a little bit of extra time into the schedule and you let the bus kind of, you know, sit there um, is that the bus is more likely then to be able to leave on time if you implement this rule that the bus has to wait a right. little bit and leave on leave on time, and uh, the disadvantage is the bus sits and waits. Right, right. <laughs> it's slower. Yeah. So if you're somebody moving through the stop, you're, you're slower. Yeah. And you have therefore a bit of a trade off, right? So you get a more reliable bus the more you. I mean, a bus that never moves and yeah. is never supposed to move is perfectly reliable. <laughs> But of course, it's completely useless. So you have a balance, and the minute the minute you have a trade off like that, yeah. um, you have the potential to try and optimize something. Right? It's right. a bit of a, an engineering sort of calculus principle is that you can you have the potential to optimize. And so uh, what I what I looked at was saying, okay, so can you can I get information about a route about how the bus behaves on a route, yeah. and then use that to suggest and optimize the places where you should put these points and how many points you should have for this and how much control you should have and how much you should just sort of let things go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So um, it's sort of this this competing nature. So to do that, I uh, I kind of tapped into the, the physics principle of... Um, called Brownian motion. So there's these, okay. these particles. If you put some particles suspended on a fluid, they tend to wiggle. They have this sort of natural wiggling energy. And... Um, you know, with the interactions with the, with the atoms and the molecules, they, they wiggle. And if you were to stand on a bus and you, you, you go along and every time it gets to a stop, you write down, you know, how many minutes early or late it is. Yeah. It also tends to wiggle, oh, right? It has the same thing. Stock markets do the same thing. Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty standard sort of mathematical concept. Yeah. And um, so I used that principle to model how buses behave so that I can sort of say, okay, well, if I change things, because what I needed was a bit of a laboratory situation where right. I could change things and see how the bus would react to to different scheduling ideas and different different ways to sort of organize the, the route. 
um, which you can't just do in real life, right? Because you can't just go changing bus systems willy nilly. And even then, there's so many factors going on; it's hard to say. So. Right. So how did how did you end up modeling it? Was it just a mathematical construct that? Yeah. So it, yeah. it's a set of of mathematical equations. It's it's essentially a, a bunch of of matrices that you can you can use, and, and it's I you know I put it into a computer program and. Um, built sort of a bit of software to play with that kind of thing. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's it's a very theoretical, very theoretical model. But yeah. we did, you know, I did end up finding that there are definitely places, you know, I used Calgary Transit, a few routes on Calgary Transit yeah. as a, uh, as sort of a, a testing ground. And, and there are places where, you know, it suggests that there are a few better ways to do it or, or different principles you could follow. So, wow. So do you think that something that Calgary Transit or any transit system in the world would start adopting or looking at more seriously? <laughs> I would hope so. That'd be that'd be a really nice uh, thing to do. That's it's something I'm hoping to be able to to work with and grow on is is I have this technique and I have this yeah. um, I have this piece of of software that's been built with it. I ended up yeah. just in order to do the thesis, I ended up building myself some software that oh, cool. lets you play with a route kind of manually and see how things are things change. Wow. And uh, you know, it'd be nice to 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 go that way and and um, it's just a matter of people sort of jumping on board right is it now called the Klumpenhauer principle huh. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't get that far no I didn't I didn't decide to do that my uncle has a uh, has a a named a Klumpenhauer network he's a music theorist oh but, wow uh, so I thought I'd just leave it leave the name things to him but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wild yeah. oh my god uh, now you've traveled around the world um, I have yeah. And various places. Yeah. Weren't you in, I want to say Japan. Uh, I've been, so I, in the last year, the last couple of years, since 2016, I've been in uh, Shanghai, so yeah. in China, uh, Hong Kong, yeah. and Seoul in Korea. Oh, okay. Uh, and also, you know, Amsterdam. I've been to Europe a fair few times. Cool. So. Now, were you doing that for your studies or uh, like to sort of see their systems? Yeah, they were all for, they were all for conferences. Okay. Um, so, but you know. I find actually the most educational part of the of those kinds of trips is just sort of going around the city and see how people move. Right. Um, it's it's an interesting you know another thing about about transit is that the idea the 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 positive part of transit is that it it provides freedom right, it, right. if really the better the transit system is the 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 faster and easier it is to get around the more freedom you have yeah and um, cars provide a lot of freedom for a lot of people not everybody can drive but yeah. cars provide a lot of freedom for a lot of people but the problem is that they they have a negative feedback loop of of using up the space right. and you know this is why we add you add a lane to Deerfoot and it's just going to get congested and then you're going to end up in the same problem. LA right. has these massive highways and they're always clogged. Toronto, yeah. Right. Same idea. So so the but but with transit, there's sort of this positive feedback loop where the the more the better transit gets, the more people will use it, the less space it takes up, the more room it has to sort of improve itself. And, yeah, and yeah. So, sort of sort of in that way. So, huh. So uh, just to jump off uh, onto another little sure. tangent here. So C train and the green line. Yeah. Coming. And <clears throat> we had talked a while ago about it's bullshit <laughs> that I get on at Sunnyside, have to pay three bucks to go downtown because there's not even a stop there before I hit the free zone. And we had talked a little bit about other places that have got a, what do you call that? The Dis distance based fare or, yeah. or there's a lot of different sort of schemes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, a book uh, by there's a transit consultant Jarrett Walker and he has a book called Human Transit, uh, which is just a really it's a good read for anybody to yeah. to have a look at. Very accessible book. <clears throat> uh, but you know he he spends a little bit talk time talking about fares and, and musing about fares. I I'm not sure if it's in the book or on his blog. Um, but there's all these different ways you could think about what's what's a fair fare, right? What's right. what's 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 an appropriate <laughs> fare? Um, and uh, you know, you could say, well, okay, you know, if we're, if we're looking really economical, what we should do is, well, a bus costs a certain amount per minute to run. Right. So if we just took the cost of the bus and divided it by the number of people on the bus and charged them that way. Oh my so goodness. the busier the bus is, the cheaper your fare is. And the right. Of course, that's an absolutely sort of <laughs> in, ridiculous notion in the sense that people. Because if you were like the one guy in the bus at one o'clock in the morning. Right. You're paying 500 bucks to right, get home right. from the bar. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and that's kind of a, a user pay or, or a sort of a bit of a, yeah. a pay for service. And you go, well, you know, but but in a way that's, you know, there is a bus running and it's being used less and it's being run as a service yeah. to, to be accessible. It's not necessarily intended to have a lot of riders on it. Right. In that sense. Um, there's also, you know, the more common way to go is is a distance related fare. Right. Um, and, 
yeah, so the idea being the more of it you use, the better, right? And right. there's been some interesting, when you have a very commuter service like we do, yeah. it's an interesting thing where, um, you know, if you get on, f- if you if you get on further, you're getting more distance, so yeah. you're kind of getting a better deal. Sure, yeah. Right? And, you know, you're likely to get a seat, you're more likely to get a seat, so you have a higher chance of a more comfortable ride, you could yeah. say, right? So you could, you know, you can make an argument that, that they're, and it, it and it does cost more to run transit out into the into the suburbs. So that's right. that is sort of a uh, a distance interesting distance argument. Um. <clears throat> okay, before I get into this next thing, so I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to have a, I'm going to open this beer. Sure, I'll join you. Um, so I've been getting a bunch of different local beers on the show. So Fitzsimmons has been a, a really great sponsor to Absolutely, us. Yeah. Uh, they're up in Airdrie and. Um, and then I had uh, uh, Common Crown, mm-hmm. uh, which was delicious. And now this one is the Good Mood Brewery, and it's a cream ale, and I'm dying to try it. I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> All right, let's give it a shot. <laughs> but Calgary has got a dearth of um, like local craft beers. It's just incredible. Yeah, have you seen? Uh, there's a I think there's a, a website YYC Beer Map. I think it is now. Oh. They're building a map. They're trying to kind of build a bit of a... Amazing. Yeah, beer map. Because you can you can really... Uh, yeah, you can you can not have the same beer twice for a long time. <laughs> for a long time, yeah. <laughs> and, and drink real local. Yeah, we... Uh, a bunch of us uh, hosted the uh, Big Four Roadhouse and Cookhouse right. at Stampede. And they had just a ton of craft beers in there. Yeah. Uh, and I recently had one called Nitro Stout from... Um, Rail, rail yard. And yeah. Oh my God, that's delicious. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so this beer is amazing. Uh, I like it. Way to go, Good Mood Brewery. I'll drink that again for sure. Absolutely. And uh, I just I wanted to have this beer to tackle this next topic, and that is the topic of paying for your train rides. Because here's the thing about Calgary. So I've been to New York. And I've gone through the turnstiles in New York. I've done the Metro card. And it's fairly gated. You can't get through if you don't have a card unless you're in a movie and you can jump over the turnstiles uh, and somehow get on the train that way. Calgary, though, is a completely wide open uh, thing. And uh, so you can get on without paying if you want to. Now, there is a risk attached to this and that it would be the fine. So uh, myself and Jennifer got on at ACAD after an event and there's like a whole bunch of people waiting for tickets. And we're just going down one stop to Sunnyside. So I can't get at the tickets. The train's there. We just decide to jump on anyways. Transit cop. <laughs> and the transit cops are great. I mean, they're really nice people. And uh, they could have given us two tickets. Instead, they gave me the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you wants? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Anyway, it was a fun discussion with these guys. But I also know that there's... I, there's some math, there's some statistics and probabilities involved in the free ride system. And what do you know about that, if anything? <laughs> only only what I've sort of thought about uh, thought about in my head. I think I wrote a, a blog post about it at one point. Um, but, you know, just a little bit about thinking about what is the best strategy from from an enforcement point of view right. to, to do it, right? And and I think what I ended up saying was to be as unpredictable as, as possible. Right? Oh, to interesting. So yeah. I remember I had a I had a, a, an experience. <laughs> I have I had, you know, was doing my PhD, so I had a transit pass with uh, with school. But um, I went to took the train up and went to Kilkenny's on, on Yeah. Um, at Brentwood there. At Brentwood there. So at Brentwood Station and I come out and they're waiting at the door onto the platform. Yeah. Um, to check as you come off the train. So they're just checking everybody at Brentwood. They're not riding the train. So oh, interesting. So I, I went through. I went. I had, you know, a few beers um, at uh, Kilkenny's. It was a few hours, probably like two or three hours. And yeah. it okay, was done. Came back. Went down to the station. They're still there. I said, well, you guys checked me on the way in. I'm surprised you're still here. And the the, the, the transit cop sort of gives me a, uh, a sort of glinty-eyed look and said, we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> sort of that, so, so it was sort of that, that balance of, right, and, and I've, I thought a bit more about it from a cost point of view, and I thought about, okay, so what's, what is it, what would it cost to, to let's forget the capital cost of putting everything in, but what would right. it cost to, 
to actually maintain all the turnstiles and you need somebody at every station because there's going to be strollers or there's going to be some awkward thing. Yeah. Right, Every subway station in New York, there's usually somebody, there's an attendant there yeah. to deal with all the weird situations or the machine doesn't work or whatever the problem is. Yeah. So you have to employ all those people and you have to, you have to do that versus the amount of people that actually... Uh, get free rides, right? right? The amount of money you're losing from a revenue service. Yeah. Plus, with your current scheme, like how much more expensive would it be to do this, to do a different scheme, plus the, the revenue you get, I suppose, from tickets, from, from it succeeding, the yeah. current one. And I'm guessing that, that when you did, when you crunch the numbers, it doesn't, it doesn't seem worth, you know, investing whatever, however many millions of dollars it would be to, right. to come and on. maintaining that yeah. regularly. And, yeah. And I mean, that that's a little separate from the fact that it should maybe be easier to buy tickets or you should have some sort of uh, Oyster card or Presto Pass or some yeah. sort of, um, you know, electronic card where you can just tap yeah. and it turns you, and you, you know, you tap and then you're good for 90 minutes, yeah. right? It charges you $3 on your card and yeah. you're good for 90 minutes and, and the peace officers have a a little machine and you check it, right? So that, yeah. that kind of stuff is definitely there and should be there to make things easier. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of like controlling the entrance and exit, I think we've sort of made a fundamental decision about yeah about our philosophy towards getting well, on and off. Well, I like it. And, like and, it, I think it's 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 awesome. That yeah. You can just do it. You yeah. know, get on, get off. Um, there's not a lot of unless you're going to the stampede, which is insanity. Right. But um, yeah, the uh, the whole idea around you know, the math behind it is, is interesting. The, um, I love how they now have tap on the tickets so you can buy tickets through tap now, Pretty which quick, is yeah. so good because uh, they didn't have that for a long time. No, you had to no. have exact change and it's like a weird amount. Yeah. yeah. And then they had credit cards, but they didn't, I don't know if they had the tap. No, first, they didn't. They, they, yeah, yeah. So you'd sit there and have to put in your pin and all that yeah. stuff. It's crazy. Anyway, I, I, I really, you know, how would you rate Calgary's transit? You know, I, I don't know what to rate it against, but <laughs> what, what's your feeling without, you know... Or on, uh, you know, and also on by what metric, right? Yeah. So, you know, from a customer service point of view or from a, you know, network point of view, just a general overarching thing, yeah. right? Um, there's an interesting... It's a good place to talk about it. There's a, there's a... There's another trade-off, and transit's full of sort of trade-offs and compromise. That's why it works. Yeah. That's why it's more efficient. But, you know, it, it is a trade-off. And one of the big ones is the idea of, of ridership or frequency of service, having things come often, versus everybody being close to a bus stop, right? Right. So if you have a fixed budget, which you always do with mm -hmm. the transit system, you, you can spend more money to have transit be near everybody but not come very often, right? Right. Or you can focus on saying, okay, where are the most people going to use it yeah. the most often? And we're going to run buses all the time there. It's going to be fast. It's going to be efficient. We're going to put our money into sort of moving the most number of riders right. rather than providing the most amount of access. And obviously, it's a spectrum. There's no right answer. It's sort of a value judgment that you have to make yeah. um, about where you land on it. And uh, right now, I, you know, you can if you just pull out a transit map or you have a look at it, you know, you can... You would know that there's, we're very coverage. We kind of lean towards the coverage side of yeah, the totally. a little bit, right? It's not a 50 50 thing. It's a little bit that way. Um, because there's a, because we've decided that there's a value that, that serving all of Calgary, having all of Calgary, that if you buy a house in Royal Oak, that you will be, uh, you should be able to catch a bus right. nearby. Um, and so, you know, if you if you evaluate it on how it's doing with ridership, then it's yeah. a little bit unfair, right? Yeah. It's a little bit, um, it, it's it's unfair to do that. Or if you evaluate on how easy it is to to get around the city when we focused on building to get people in and out of the city and having you know, yeah. the most ridership, then that's also unfair. So I think for I think the biggest hindrance and the biggest challenge with calgary transit is the layout of our city oh yeah it's just simply <laughs> it's huge right yeah and and mm -hmm. grids are much more efficient and curvy roads are not right yeah. for any sort of public service for garbage or anything like that for yeah. um and so it's it's a, that's the difficult conundrum and it's a fixed amount of budget and we could decide you know if we wanted to as a city say okay we're gonna we're going to decide that we're going to have an you know an amazing but very expensive transit service and everybody's going to have service fast and it would be you know we'd have to raise taxes a whole bunch right. we have to sort of do that kind of thing so given what it's been given to i i i tend to get the impression and the more i've talked to people and the more i've sort of thought about it that they actually doing a pretty good job of yeah. of working with it and the 
the gripes I had about they want I I I've wanted them to sort of grid up the system a bit more so yeah. try and sort of get people around cross town this BRT network that they're building yeah which they're now naming Max they're oh. naming it Max they, they're rebranding it like M A X yeah okay um to not confuse it with our existing right. BRT which is not a BRT <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute yeah our most 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 places in the world when they bus BRT is bus rapid transit so. Yeah. Most places in the world that sort of implies generally, the way I tend to picture it, is buses coming quite often, so quite frequently, no less than any 10 minutes, like right. 10 minutes or, or more frequent, um, running mostly on their own right of way. So having a bus lane or a yeah. bus way or something like that, sort of away from, separated from traffic and in these sort of direct corridor routes. So, right. you know, in a way, if you thought, well, let's take the LRT, but make it buses, yeah. right? That's yeah. sort of what I think it would be. So fewer fewer stops. If uh, yeah, because so I know there used to be a uh, what the hell was it called? Uh, blue something. Yeah, blue something. something. Yeah. But you could, so when I grew up in Silver Springs, my dad would take the express, whatever that was, right from Silver Springs, no stops all the way down to downtown. They'd right. have three stops downtown. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of a, a very much a commuter shuttle, right? Right. Yeah. So so but the idea is it would be it, you'd space it a little bit more like uh, like an LRT in the sense that you know it would oh, be okay. fairly. Sp- larger stop spacing it doesn't come very often and then you shuttle other feed other services into it yeah um just an other sort of way of having a frequent service like that but what we have what our brts what we call brt right now is just a a a bus route that runs on another the same other bus route but it skips you know every third stop or it only stops every third or fourth stop and that's sort of an uh, an express or limited stop type service, but it's yeah. not really a BRT. When you if you were to go to other, any other city in the world and say we have a BRT, that's not what they would think of, right? right. So that's part of this rebranding, and I think that's it's right. important. It's an important thing to do. The only bus lane I've ever seen in the city is the one on Crowchild. Uh, they've got that one right after Thirty Second or Thirty Third. And it runs yeah. up until yeah. the old children's hospital. Yeah, and that's it. It's yeah, so that's part of that's going. That's part of the Southwest BRT corridor. So there's going uh, to be okay. soon um, along 14th Street a yeah. dedicated two-way bus only oh. and emergency vehicles only uh, road. Wow, roadway on the right on the well on the and that's left hand side. That's that crazy shit they're building by Heritage and yeah. Anderson. That, that's, yeah, that's and that then mess. The 90th Avenue that's going to go under 90th Avenue, oh. I believe. There's there's a lot of, and then it's going to make its way into uh, Cedar Bray and, and oh, Woodbine, cool. I think. So there's that 17th Avenue Southeast yeah. International Avenue now has its own dedicated corridor for buses, and they're no, building a bus only bridge to come over into Inglewood. Oh, I saw that. So that's what that that's construction what that, is. Oh, yeah. I was wondering yeah. what so that. They're really turning up the dial on that kind of thing. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. Um, and I, it's been a while since I've done this, but do you still have to pay for parking when you go to like a, a train oh, station? Park and ride? Park and ride? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Because I always thought that was sort of an asshole thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'd lied somewhere on the opposite side, actually. We had a, yeah. a, an interesting discussion with Danielle Smith about this. But um, land near transit stations is valuable. Sure. Right? Good transit stations. Brentwood's a great example. Things are starting mm-hmm. to pop up and densify and you get oh, yeah. you know, transit oriented development. It's sort of the buzzword for that. But it's it's valuable. And parking is kind of a weird way to use really valuable land. Right? Okay. Is the way I sort of think about it. Yeah, I get that. What you what you'd prefer really is instead of people ideally instead of people having to drive there yeah. if they just lived there in the first place. Right? That's sort of the way I think about it. <laughs> and and what happens what's happening with you if you look at the park and ride lots, they kind of they've done some studies where they count when people show up. Yeah. And it fills up almost immediately in a lot of these places yeah. very early on. And so those people that are leaving early to park at the LRT probably would be able to get downtown with very little congestion, like early six in the morning kind right. of thing. Right. But they don't want to pay for parking. They're the right. Exactly. <laughs> so like parking downtown, I mean, which yeah. is extraordinary. And so from an economics point of view, if something fills up inefficiently, yeah. you're pricing it wrong. Right? <laughs> And the idea would be that you should actually price price it higher until you get it to ha- in, until people show up in the in a sort of way that means that spots are efficient. People will also you could reserve spots, but then people would reserve spots and then not use them. 
Uh-huh. And so now there's empty spots sitting there. But right? are they paid empty spots? They're paid empty spots, but they're not paid a whole lot. Right. right? I mean, I think it's like three bucks or something. It, they yeah. kind of went back and forth on the thing. But, you know, if it's if it's valuable enough for people to want to use it, you should try to charge the appropriate amount, is sort of my thinking. Yeah. Right? Um, so it's it's that's an interesting sort of thing. There's people who go, well, it's not convenient because I need to. And I, I get it. You know, I'm... I'm just a, a guy with no kids. I don't have to drive people to a daycare. I don't right. you know. So I, <laughs> I don't have I don't have those things, and so I can see the convenience of it. Uh, but I also really think that we tend to not pay enough for the conveniences we get in a lot of in a lot of situations. So, so in your mind, is the transit system a um, is it cash neutral, cash negative, and cash positive? Um, right now here. Uh, uh, the policy at City Hall is that the fare for transit should pay for half of it. Okay. So that you pay $3 and the trip actually costs $6. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a number that, I don't know, you can decide what's a good number for that to be or not. Yeah. Um, so I, I, there's there's good arguments either way, yeah. right? Um, it's it's interesting that with transit, because of this fare payment, people see themselves paying it, and you can sort of do this math. Um, whereas, you know, the same thing comes for for roads and for yeah. for you know highways and right. stuff. That there's a we pay for it. It's just not an obvious thing unless gotcha. it's a toll, right? There's yeah. not an obvious thing. Huh. So it's a little bit it's a little bit of a psychological difference in the sense that okay, well, we are you know paying for the roads too as a as a sure. society, but yeah. Damn, uh, man. Okay, so I, um, this has been an education, as always. Uh, what's next for you? Like now that you're Dr. Klumpenhauer. Yeah. So I am actually I've uh, I'm moving out to Toronto. Yeah. Um, and uh, working for now at the Ministry of Transportation. Really? Yeah. yeah That's in Ontario. Cool. Yeah. So I haven't I haven't started yet. So I can still go do these kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, When are you gone? Uh, this end of this week, I'm only here. Yeah. I'm only here for just for a little brief time. So are you going to uh, be doing some stuff at sour dog when you get out there? Uh, yeah. And there's a, there's a group in uh, Kitchener Waterloo actually called theater on the edge. Oh, um, fun. That's, uh, that I did when I, I did my undergrad in Guelph. So they, they're a, they're a fun, fun group as well. Awesome. Group, so. Are you, uh, like, so for those that don't know you, I mean, we met through loose moose theater. Yeah. And uh, you're one of the funnest people to work with on stage. <laughs> We've done a few uh, kids shows. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's What's your plan for the theater? Are you if support role? Do you want to be on stage more? Like, what are you thinking? Um, I just I like I like doing it. I've always really enjoyed um, doing supporting stuff and tech and yeah. and um, we are one of the best snoggers I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I've had <laughs> some fun with that. Yeah. I've had some fun with that for sure. So yeah, I, I hope to keep doing some supporting stuff. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, there it's a little more comfortable going on stage and, and, um, you know, I don't know, I might end up doing a little bit of teaching and, yeah. you know, when you come from the loose moose, you kind of have, <laughs> you kind of have a bit of clout and people, yeah. <laughs> people take you seriously. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we're very fortunate in this yeah, city absolutely. to have that. Yeah. And without cities, you wouldn't have things like loose moose, right? That's, that's, that's one, something that's very unique to to having people live closer together. Yeah. A smaller place couldn't support a thing like that, right? Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. Um, have you ever done any international stuff in theaters, like when you've traveled or just... No. No way. No. Because I was thinking about doing that too, like next time I go traveling is yeah. to look up... Because right now the Loose Moose has got the International Summer School, yeah. which is... Yeah, it was from, at the, the party last night. Oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah. awesome. I was at the Melvins. Ah, uh, okay. Which was awesome. <laughs> 48 years old, still got it in the mosh pit. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so you're on your way to Ontario. You're going to work for the Ministry of Transportation. Yeah. You're going to fix Ontario's transportation. <laughs> or is it like the uh, like Canada? No, it's uh, it's the province. It's, it's province. the provincial government. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, fix. It's <laughs> another it's another funny thing that you go anywhere. I, I, every time I've gone, I visit people and I go, you know, oh, I'm a, or I see people from out of town. Oh, yeah, I, I study transit or I've got, I'm doing my PhD in transportation, I'm studying transit. Oh, can you come and fix our our transit system right <laughs> like it's something that you can look at and just you know like with calgary so people yeah. go, oh you can fix calgary I said well given what you're what they're given to work with the tools you're given to work with it's you yeah. know, they're not doing a bad job right yeah. so a lot of times it's a little bit like well you know how much funding can you get from your from your <laughs> representative somewhere and how right. much you know like how many how many how much can you get 
cities to be designed in a way that's more transit friendly. And, you know, right. Those yeah. are bigger existential problems that, you know. Yeah. What do you think about, uh, I hear Germany, I've never been to Germany, but I've heard that their transit system is unmatched anywhere. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, the Europe Europe has the advantage of being uh, quite dense and, yeah. and having like a lot of these sort of urban centers quite close to each other. Yeah. Um, and they've also decided, they've realized, right? The, the Dutch have done it a little bit with biking, but yeah. they've also with transit and trains as well. They've realized there's not, they just, they ran out of room quickly. So yeah. they said there's not enough room to just keep building roads. Right. We need to figure out a different way to a do better this, way. right? Yeah. And so almost out of necessity, they've sort of, they've innovated and developed that kind of thing. And, and it, it's interesting to see, you know, in Asia, there's, like Shanghai built this absolutely, China built this massive metro system yeah. in a matter of years. Just this absolutely phenomenal metro system, and I, it was, it's, it's interesting to see that you know, I've, when I was there, there's, there's things about China that are not particularly free from, from you know, the media, from, from different things like that. Right. But on the other hand, I can walk out the door and get on a train and go across this, or get on a subway and get across the city and go visit somebody, and I don't need a lot of money to do it, and I don't need a car, and I don't need to, wow. you know, I don't need to have any sort of license or credentials or anything to do that, and that's freedom, right? There's a lot of freedom there. Interesting. And there's a little bit of this balance, right? Yeah, Whereas, yeah. but you know, and then as the state, they say, well, we're just going to build this transit system. That's what we're going to do, yeah. and then they do it. Right. right. Whereas here, it's a lot more painful and a lot more. <laughs> Everybody's got an presence. opinion on it. And, yeah. So yeah. it's this interesting sort of, I don't know, balance or, or, or you know, different different aspects of, yeah. of things. So it was really, it was kind of enlightening to see that and um, and to see, you know, just the, the scale of the amount of people that can be moved. Right. You know, from from a, in a transit system is like if these all these people were in cars, it would yeah, just you would be piled high right yeah yeah oh my god i it's, i was uh when i was growing up in silver springs this guy moved in he was a university student his name was khalid uh -huh. and he was from egypt uh -huh. and uh it was stampede time and we were at banff trail station uh -huh. and i think the last stop was university at that yeah. time yeah uh, that was the last one <clears throat> anyway we had to get from banff trail to university so it goes under the tunnel and Shit like that. Anyway, the train's packed, right? So I ended up getting onto the train. I don't see Khaled anywhere. He's on the back of the train holding on because that's what he does in Egypt. That's how you ride a train in Egypt when it's packed. You just get on the train. <laughs> get, like, not in it. Not on, on it. <laughs> on it. So he, like, the whole time was hanging off the back. Do, do, do. Got to university station, jumped off. And I was just like, what are you doing? He's like, oh. Like, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't do, do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, man. Yeah, that was pretty wild. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's a fun story. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on the bike lane while I got you here? Uh, or bike lanes, I yeah, should say. Yeah, bike lanes in general. Yeah. Um, they're really good. I've I've sort of been... <laughs> it's, it's, it's fundamental when, when talking about bike lanes to realize that the difference between something like a bike lane yeah. and an actual cycling infrastructure like a cycle track like right. on 12th avenue or or something separated yeah because the the approach is all ages all abilities right that's what they aa aa 4a something like yeah, that all okay. ages all abilities and the idea is that all ages and all abilities will ride on the cycle track they won't ride on a bike lane right right they just won't so it doesn't it doesn't attract more people gotcha and so you know you can make the argument well we paint all these bike lanes and we don't see more people going on them yeah in the, or a, a drastic amount of more people going on them. Yeah. Well, it's because you didn't, right? You didn't do it. And <laughs> and there's these there's these little you know within it's it's really interesting to see that sort of it's a, starts as a fragmented network. Yeah. And if there's one spot on your route that is un, feels unsafe for your ability or for your for yeah. your comfort level, you're not gonna you're not gonna go. Right. Right. So you can build, you know. It's like saying, well, I'm going to build a massive bridge over a river, but I'm going to leave 10 feet open, <laughs> right? People aren't going to drive across the bridge. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> that's sort of the way to look at it. And so you can't say, well, nobody's driving across the bridge. And yeah. I say, well, there's a hole in your bridge. That's why there's nobody's driving across it. <laughs> and of course, that's a very, very you know, obvious example. But, but that's sort of my thinking. And so what we need to do, what we're, what we're hopefully going towards and what we need to push for is just a better more of a network right and it'll just start to grow in places where they've really gone full mm -hmm. in like edmonton saw our sort of minor success and they jumped on it oh. and they 
they um, they went with like a full grid system downtown with protected cycle lanes, and they've seen a huge boost in cycle traffic. Oh, that's cool. right. And so you know now I think we need to look at them and get jealous and and do it here too. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, my, absolutely, that's my hope. <laughs> I was in Victoria recently, and of course they've got they've had cycle lanes there forever. Um, but one thing I love about them is they've got they have and I forgot what they're called. They're like car to goes, but they're bicycles. Right. And, and I saw those also in New York as well, where you yeah. could basically just swipe a bike, uh, ride it to where you want, get off the bike, leave it. It's phenomenal. Well, then they just council just voted. I think it was. I'm not sure if it was council or if it was a um, it was a committee, but they unanimously voted to do a pilot bike share in Calgary. Nice. And it's coming soon. Oh, I'm so excited. for uh, that. And it's dockless. So it's, you know, like the, oh, the yeah, original yeah. systems had, you had to yeah. stop at the docks or whatever. These are ones where essentially it tracks on, on the bike, just yeah. like car to go. And, uh, and um, it's got, a, it's got like a, a, a clamp brake or something yeah. to yeah. yeah, pretty simple sort of mechanism. I've used the ones in Hamilton, actually. Uh, Sobi is the yeah. S O B I is the, the company there. And it's really nice. You, you, you do it and you get a little bit of a, a credit or a bonus if you bring it to sort of a, a, a locking um, station that's a bit of a hub. Yeah. But you can leave it anywhere within the zone. God, but cool. you just get a little bit of a, an advantage to bring it, bring yeah. it there. And I think that's what they have in Victoria because I, I, there was bikes just on a kickstand. Yeah. Like, and you could just go up and grab it. They have a helmet in the basket. There you go. If you want to wear that. Um, yeah. Was- yeah. And, and Kelowna, Kelowna's just been rolling out a, a bike share program Amazing. too. And uh, so I think it's, I mean, it's high time now that we have a network and we're starting to grow and we're, yeah. you know, and now we need to get people out because even, you know, it's not just for tourists, right? It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's useful for, for all kinds of things in Toronto. Um, you know, I can pay $90 for the year and get an unlimited amount of 30 minute trips. If I keep my trips in it, which I, really? I can get from, you know, union station to my work in 30 yeah. minutes easily. It's amazing. So, you know, that's now a viable option yeah. for a lot of people to just hop on the bike for, for whatever, go for lunch, come back. Right. Okay, so right. what a yeah. great idea, man. Yeah. Like yeah. A, so there, genius. there it's, you know, it's, it's high time. They, they brought it up a few years back and it got shut down. Yeah. And I think now with the cycle track and structure, they decided, yeah, let's do something we should probably do. So yeah, well, that's, that's a great idea. I wonder if it's going to like, if they'll limit it during winter, um, if that'll be, cause I always thought that was kind of one of the problems that we had to deal with, with a bicycle sharing is like the winterization of the bikes and the uh, I mean, there's places with bike shares that are get just as cold and snowing. I mean, Toronto's no exception in terms yeah, of fair, right. Yeah. It gets cold and wet and ice storms in Montreal, yeah. and and people will will use it. You know, especially if the paths get cleared, yeah. like they've been doing. And and so I, I think I think winners I think winners sometimes a bit of an excuse to yeah. to not do something. But I think I think it's I think it'd be, people will surprise you. Yeah, you know that kind of thing. Cyclists are they vehicles or pedestrians? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there, I I don't know that it, that's that's a, that's a fun question that assumes. I think there are a little <laughs> bit of assumes what? Well, it assumes that there's there's an answer, but <laughs> there, there's a little bit of of um, you know when I when I was biking, especially when I used to bike to high school every day, and I would behave exactly like a car. Right. Right. I would do that, and the amount of times I you know I had to make a left turn. So I would, you know, go and I'd make my way over to the left lane and I'd sit in front of the light. And the amount yeah. of times I got somebody got out of their car once and started yelling at me and oh like, you know, oh, you're not a car. Don't be like a car. Well, OK, but I've been told to do that. And then, yeah. you know, I feel bad biking on a sidewalk. That's not a particularly nice thing to do either. Yeah. Right. So the the point is that there is. They're a mode of transportation that is missing some sort of infrastructure. Right. Right. Yeah. They're they're cyclists. Yeah. And so really they should behave like cyclists and there should be roads for them. And that's what these sort of right. tracks are. I think that's sort of the, the, the conclusion I've come to is that, you know, that's, that's what it is. And until then, you know, you try and find a way to keep safe and keep other people safe and, yeah. and go from there. But really the, the right answer to me is they're neither. Yeah. They're, they're their own thing. They're a unique. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So they're a hybrid. Yeah. yeah. And, and there are places in the world, like Holland's a beautiful example where they've, you know, that is very accepted yeah. and understood. Yeah. And there it's acknowledged because there's places all over the place. Bikes are always thought of in the transportation system. They're not an afterthought. Yeah. So interesting. Then, yeah. And so you, you see the effect of it. I just saw a, 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 um, an article 
I forget how many kilometers of bike track we have, uh -huh. like a uh, bike path. Right. Through it, because it goes through the entire city. It's the largest network in the yeah, world. Yeah, the regional pathway system. Yeah, it's it's Jeez. it's big. Yeah, yeah. So we have a we have a nice sort of spine or backbone, yeah. right? And we're working on getting from that backbone into downtown. Yeah. And now we have to work from getting from that background backbone into other areas, right? Yeah. So the Edmonton Trail cycle track, for example, the one that goes up Edmonton yeah. Trail is a great example of that, acknowledging that we got to get people up that way. And yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. So segue, uh, favorite restaurant in Calgary? Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's probably somewhere near where... Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> There's so many good restaurants. Or you can give me the top three if you want, or just um, places. It my favorite the place, uh, the, I would say the best banh mi, the place to get a Vietnamese sub is Thai Thai next to Western. Oh, okay. Uh, best place to get ramen, I would go to Muku. I'm a big Muku fan. Like right behind right, us right here. Yeah. yeah. Um, think about comfort food. Best place to get beer. Yeah. That's a... That's a, just a toss. That's a total crap shoot. They're oh, all great. Yeah. <laughs> we were just at Beer Revolution. Yeah. Uh, that, I, I spend a lot of time there, yeah. um, live nearby, and, and it's great because they, they change a lot over. Yeah. Um, God, best restaurant. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Those are actually the you know best ramen is awesome. Yeah, um, absolutely. Best Italian that you've had. Oof. And it's funny that I... I some places I think about the food and some places I just think about, you know, the fact that I have memories there or something. So yeah. I used to go to Fiore's because it was right oh, across yeah. from Western. And you could, you could, on a good day, if you left right when the buzzer went in high yeah. school, you could get to Fiore's, eat food, and get out, have a nice sit-down <laughs> meal at Fiore's and get <laughs> back. Awesome. So I've done that. They've got great food there, too. Yeah, they're, they're quite good. And it's definitely affordable. Um, and, uh, and I like going to Chibo. Yeah, late on Fridays and Saturdays for the for their delicious pizza. So. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. A uh, best nighttime entertainment. Oh, Blues Can, Blues Can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know what? I'll put Blues Can in there with the best 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 food too. They cage in their Cajun food. I had to die frogs for. legs there. Never had frog legs ah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, disturbing on so many levels because I'm not an adventurous eater. Yeah, but in, in this case, I was. But man. Like it is freaking delicious. It's like, have you ever, you've been to Booker's? Uh, no, I've been to Palomino, but I haven't been to Booker's. Okay. I'd love to go to Booker's. Yeah, because they've got awesome food there as well. Yeah, Palomino's good too. But yeah, yeah. Blues Can just for an evening, for whatever evening you want. That's my, <laughs> that's my go to. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Um, people that are listening to this and they're like, oh man, like, uh, Will, you've done so many cool things. Um, what advice would you give to people? that are, you know, thinking about either exploring a, 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 their rebellious side a little, um, you know, or just starting something different. What would you say? Yeah. I mean, from, from, from a rebellious side or from a, from a sort of being a bit active or activist a little bit, I found that, um, the best success I had was to just be obnoxiously positive, right? <laughs> that, you know, people will, people will go negative and people will, and, and, and I have expressed frustration at times or, or, you know, but you can still stay positive in the sense of right. where, you know, I can see we're doing our best, but you know, we're here or it's too bad that this is the way, but I'm, you know, it's positive. Right. And the positivity has gotten me farther, much farther than, than anything else. Right. Yeah. People, people only like to hear people rant for so long. Sorry. So, oh yeah. Until you tune out and you're just like, I gotta go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> this person's just an upset person. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's been, that's been really positive in terms of, of, you know, talking about transportation and about, about cities. Um, I really, you know, I got really got inspired with the figuring out how to translate and, and talk about, you know, something like a planning and a, and a, and a transit job and, and talking about it in a way that's accessible to more people and has this sort of universal logic, this geometry logic. Right. That was all from Jarrett Walker from Human Transit. So yeah. he's humantransit.org, I believe. Just Google Human Transit. Cool. I'll put the link in the description. Absolutely. Yeah. So he's, you know, he kind of inspired me to say, oh, I could, I could write about this kind of stuff. And yeah. there was a blog in um, Hamilton called Raise the Hammer. And mm -hmm. it's sort of a, um, it's sort of a, a sort of pushback to some of the noise about stuff that's going on there. They're been trying to build an LRT and there's people that they're, the government, the Ontario government wanted to give them an LRT 
oh. for free. Pay for it. Yeah. And people said, oh, no, we don't actually want it. And anyways, it's <laughs> happening as far as I know. But but that sort of level of conversation, that started me to do the blog. And, and yeah. from that came the radio. And so, you know, that kind of stuff was all figuring out how to how to translate what you know and think about. But yeah, human transit, Jarrett Walker, just for learning how to how to talk, you know, talk about things in a accessible and intelligent way when That's it comes awesome. to transit. It's really good. Cool. Yeah. This has been an absolute blast. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to Good Mood Brewery. For yeah, it's the good stuff. Tasty uh, cream ale. I like that the barcode is shaped like Alberta. I enjoy that. Right. It's like the little touches. It's the small things. Yeah. yeah it's the little to, things. I have to check this in on Untapped. Yeah. Uh, Do you ever I, use Untapped? No. Oh no, but uh, Cody was telling me about. Yeah. On yeah, time. yeah. I'm uh, just because I've it's challenged me to try new stuff. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, you basically you basically when you have a beer, you look it up on there. They're yeah. all in there, and you check in where you had it, what you thought of it, like the rating system, whatever. I don't. Really oh know. my god. There's there's a f- social media component to it. You can have friends or whatever. But Sweet. I just like keeping track of how many unique beers. I started last Stampede, and I'm wow. I think I'm up at like almost 200 unique beers or something. Holy! Because now I go in and I'm like, okay, what's here that I haven't tried? Right? Amazing. And, yeah. Oh, that's such a great yeah. idea for them to have done that. Is, is is that no? That's global, like or North America, right? Like that is like I think it's global. It's yeah. it, like any brewery can add their stuff. Wow! And I, we even had I have a friend of mine that does some brewing, some home brewing, and you can add it as a custom thing. And so I've you know checked in his beer. No way! Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Holy crap! Oh, that's that's so much fun. Well, make sure that you check in that you had the. Uh, I will do that. Good nude cream ale at the Rebel Rebel podcast. I will do that. And uh, thanks again so much for absolutely. Coming thanks out. for having me, Darry. It's fun times. Yeah. <laughs>Coming up next week, I sit down with the guys from Range Warrior Accessories, right? And we talk about their work on building better accessories for firearms and what's in store for the AR-180B. That and so much more. Check out next week's episode, Rebel Rebel, every Monday.